Hey. Hello. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Hey, I'm here. Chris, how you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing excellently, and uh, we're here and happy to be welcoming people to History Happy Hour. And as, as people join us today, we should ask if they can figure out uh, what is different about us today. Now, last week, it was the fact that we were wearing headphones for the first yeah. time, but this week, there's something else that's different. Um, I don't know if anybody can figure it out, but, you know, in the meantime, whether you can figure it out or not, uh, let us know that you're here. Say hello. And uh, um, uh, we're we're here, of course, uh, every <laughs> Sunday, really, whether you are really. or not, um, uh, uh, on both the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook page and YouTube page. And all of our shows are archived on the History Happy Hour web page. Um, and Ted is checking in between periods of the Islander Bolts game. Um, Neither of which matter, Ted. Yeah, I don't really just care. Want to say. Just turn that right off. Uh, history is far more important than that. Duncan joining us again from Normandy. We've got Jack and John and Doreen, and uh, and the crowd is is filling up here. Uh, right. So. Um, we switch sides. No, it's not that we switch sides. Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, Doug. But I will tell you, because we need to get on with the show. Well, Chris, you tell us. What's different? I got a haircut. Yes, and so did I. So, uh, yes, sorry. that long shagginess is gone. And uh, with that, that seems like a good time, Chris, to jump in and play the world-famous History Happy Hour Open. Okay. <laughs> And the bar is open. I don't know where the bell is, but ring. The you bar is open. The I keep losing the bell. Yeah. There um, we go. I hear the bell in the distance. That's All good right. enough. Um, our guest today, let's just jump right in. Our guest today is somebody that both Chris and I really admire. Uh, Adam Hochschild is an author, journalist, historian, and a lecturer out uh, at Berkeley in, uh, in the San Francisco area. He's written, I think, uh, 10 books. Is that correct, Adam? 10 That's books? Right. And uh, um, uh, some of my favorites include King Leopold's Ghost, uh, Bury the Chains, uh, To End All Wars, all bestsellers, all really compelling history books. Uh, and we're going to talk to him today about his book, Spain in Our Hearts, which is the story of Americans who took part in the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. So, Adam, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to History Happy Hour. Well, good to be with you. I always enjoy talking about writing history, which is so much easier than actually writing history. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes I, it is. I totally agree, especially when you can do it with a cocktail. It's early where you are, so yeah. I don't know if you, you brought one, but Chris, what did you bring for a cocktail today? Well, it, since it's the Spanish Civil War, I, I brought sangria. Yes, Very and I, appropriate. I oh, have yeah. some Spanish cream sherry. Oh, all right. So we're 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 game here for for this whole thing. Adam, while it was happening, the Spanish Civil War was headline news. There were dramatic developments that crowded out other things from the front pages. It lit a flame in the hearts of thousands of Americans who went to Spain to take up arms. Um, and today, I think most people really don't know very much about it at all. So let's start out. Tell us a little bit about this war and just what compelled you to write about it. Well, here was what the war was. In 1936, mid-1930s, uh, Spain was actually a new democracy. Uh, they had overthrown the monarchy only a few years earlier, uh, held really free elections for the first time, uh, and people were encouraged that here was a place where democracy was newly installed and seemed to be thriving. A left liberal coalition won elections in early 1936 uh, because Spain was a, a country that needed a great deal of reform. It was a land of vast inequities, you know, huge landowners owned vast tracts. Uh, many people were uh, landless peasants living in dirt-floored huts and so forth. 
this coalition that won the 1936 elections promised uh, reforms of various kinds, land reform above all. This got the right wing very stirred up. And uh, in the summer of 1936, uh, right wing army officers led a coup against the democratically elected government. And very rapidly, General Francisco Franco, young general, became the leader of that coup, and his forces began taking over the country, uh, bit by bit by bit. Only a small percentage of the land at first. By the end of the year, they had almost half of Spain under their power. What was really scary about this for people all over the world was that Franco was an ally of Hitler and Mussolini, who were already in power. And they began sending Franco arms in large quantities, uh, both because they wanted a sympathetic uh, ally in power in Spain, and for Hitler especially, it was a chance to try out a lot of the weapons for the much larger war that he was planning. And a lot of weaponry that's familiar to us from that war, like the Messerschmitt 109 fighter plane, the Stuka dive bomber, the 88 millimeter artillery piece that were German mainstays of World War II, were used in battle for the first time in Spain. So people around the world, uh, you know, on the left and liberals, small d Democrats were horrified by this. So that was what happened. What drew me into it was that, to something to write about, was that this is the only time that uh, thousands of Americans, 2,800 to be exact, went off to fight in somebody else's civil war. And those American volunteers were uh, among the some 40,000 volunteers from more than 50 countries who went to fight for the beleaguered, democratically elected government of Spain. Uh, I first got interested in this because one of my first jobs was as a newspaper reporter in San Francisco. I was 22 years old at the time, and two of the much older reporters at the paper, men in their 60s at that point, were American veterans of the Spanish Civil War. And when things were slow in the city room, I used to ask them about it. And they talked about it very readily. Uh, I got fascinated by this. Uh, then I began to read books like uh, Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls, uh, which Hemingway had written after working as a correspondent in, in the Spanish Civil War, and George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, I think one of the great nonfiction books uh, in the 20th century in English. And that made me even more interested in the war. So I thought, well, it's time to put this interest to work and write a book about the Americans who took part in this war. So, so Adam, if I could, I wanted to, to read a, a quote um, that I was kind of touched by, and it leads into a question about the international brigades. Um, this is from George Orwell. He says, in some sense, the international brigades are fighting for all of us. A thin line of suffering and ill-armed human beings standing between barbarism and at least comparative decency. So uh, given that, and given kind of the overwhelming response by, as you said, 40,000 uh, international citizens, what, what brings them there? And, wh and how, do they, how do they get there? And how do they form these international brigades? What is Orwell talking about there? Well, remember that at this time, people all over the world were really alarmed about the rise of fascism. Uh, Hitler had seized power in Germany in 1933 and immediately begun rearming the country and making clear that uh, he, he wanted to expand its territory. Mussolini had been in power in Italy since the 1920s and had gone and conquered Ethiopia. So fascism was on the rise, and there were also semi-fascist governments in power in much of Eastern Europe, from Greece to, to Lithuania. So people saw this as a rising movement uh, that had to be stopped. Uh, now, the real shame of this period is that the world's major democracies, the United States, Great Britain, and France, turned down the repeated uh, pleas of the Spanish Republic to buy arms. 
And ironically, the democratically elected government of the Spanish Republic had the money to buy arms. Why? Because Spain had been neutral in World War I, had not spent itself into bankruptcy, as had all the other major countries of Europe, and Spain had one of the world's largest gold supplies. So they had the money to buy you know, new good weapons from, the, from the, the Western democracies, but the US, Britain, France were very afraid of getting drawn into a new world war in Europe, said no, and smaller countries uh, in the West uh, followed their lead. Ironically, the only country that uh, after several months, once it became clear that uh, Britain, France, and the US were not gonna sell these arms to democratic Spain, the only country that stepped forward that was willing to do so was Stalin's Soviet Union, anything but a democracy. And just at the point, mid-1936, when Stalin was beginning the Great Purge, which sent millions of people off to the Gulag, executed hundreds of thousands, maybe as many as a million directly. Uh, so Stalin did sell arms to Spain in large quantities. They were essential for the Spanish Republic in helping it hold off uh, Franco's nationalists, as they called themselves, for some years. Um, but he demanded a lot in return, namely high positions for both Spanish and Soviet communists in the army. Uh, and so this whole war was very complicatedly connected with the question of international communism. Uh, most, though not all, of those volunteers from many countries who went to Spain were Communist Party members or sympathizers. Uh, by no means all of them, uh, but most of them were. So it was a sort of strange situation where you had this totalitarian government in the Soviet Union that was helping a democratically elected one try to stay in power. It, it's, a, it's a war that um, um, I was struck reading your book by the ferocity of the violence in this war. Um, not simply the battlefield violence, but the sort of terror and violence, you know, before and after the battle, um, and to a degree uh, by both sides that involves civilians, prisoners, women, and children. Um, and it struck me reading it that there's almost, um, I mean, I guess there's plenty of examples in history, nothing more horrifying than when the people in a country like turn against neighbor, turn against the people who live right, you know, may live right next to them or, or with whom they've interacted for many years. That's true. Uh, I think civil wars often are the, the worst because sometimes the dividing line goes through every town, city, small village. And that was the case in Spain. Uh, the country was politically very polarized uh, into uh, right and left. And, you know, largely that was determined by what class somebody belonged to. You know, the industrial workers voted for the left, the big landowners voted for the right. And Spain had had a considerable history of political violence uh, in preceding decades. Uh, very stormy strikes, uh, you know, striking miners that had you know, a few years previously, the miners' strike had been put down by the army. Actually, General Franco was uh, the leader of the troops that did that. Hundreds of people were killed. Uh, other forms of, of civil unrest. It, it, was a, it was a country with a long tradition of political violence. So one of the, one of the um, things that I've been curious about, again, I... I've always been interested in the International Brigades. Um, my dad was obsessed with Hemingway when I was growing up, so I, I at least was made somewhat familiar with it. Um, but in looking at uh, the war th and what happened after World War II, they, the International Brigades kind of get written out. You know, I live in London, and there's a big monument to um, the Eagle Squadrons that flew for the RAF during the Battle of Britain, right in front of where the old American embassy was. Um, you can talk about the Flying Tigers, and they fought the Japanese before America got involved in the war in Asia. But if you mention the Lincoln Battalion or the International Brigade, you either get kind of a dumb who you're talking about look, or you get a brush off like, well, they were just communists and it didn't really matter. And 
So how is it that they get written out of this story of these people early in the game that are saying something is wrong with the world and we have to fix it? Yeah, you're right, they do. Although there is an International Brigades Monument in London. Yes, there is. Uh, uh, and uh, there's also one in San Francisco that was just yesterday rededicated after some uh, uh, repairs were made. Right. Uh, I think they get written out of history for two reasons. One, in many ways, I think this was the first battle of World War II. I mean, after all, where else were Americans, Britons, Frenchmen in uniform being bombed by Nazi pilots? Uh, but this was happening in 1936, 37, 38. Uh, but it wasn't officially part of World War II, and then when the World War II did officially, so to speak, begin in 1939, uh, only a few months after yeah. the Spanish Civil War ended, this, the amount of bloodletting that that war took, you know, upwards of 50 million people, military and civilian, killed altogether, I believe, uh, that kind of eclipsed the earlier battle. Also, I think people feel uncomfortable about the Spanish Civil War in the West for two reasons. One is that uh, the Western countries did not come to the defense of Spain's democratically elected government, which they should have. The people who did come to its defense were, you know, in large part Communist Party members or sympathizers. And that has been sort of, makes it a little hard to, to deal with. Right. Uh, but to me, as a writer, that just makes the whole thing more fascinatingly complex. And when I set about writing this book, for instance, I wanted to find Americans who were communist true believers, uh, those who were not at all, and those who maybe were true believers but got disillusioned in the process of being there. And I have some characters of each type. Um, so t tell us about a, a couple of those people, and maybe, maybe you can start with uh, two people who are pretty main characters in your book and who I really wasn't familiar with, uh, Bob and Marion Merriman. Well, Bob Merriman was, ended up as one of the highest ranking Americans in Spain. Uh, he was uh, chief of staff of the 15th International Brigade, which was the uh, brigade that included British, American, and Canadian volunteers, and some from, from other countries as well. Uh, and he and his wife, Marion, the photo that you're seeing on the left there, that's them on their wedding day, which was 1932, the day after they graduated from the University of Nevada at Reno, when they were both students. Uh, after that, they came to Berkeley, uh, and Bob became a graduate student in the Department of Economics here in Berkeley. One of his fellow students and friends was uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. And when I was going through their letters, I almost fell off my chair when I discovered that they lived in Berkeley uh, about four blocks from where I do now, and that in a house that I pass within 30 feet of wow. every day, when I walked from my house to the university library where I do a lot of my work or to the School of Journalism where I teach a class. I'm pleased to say that there's now a plaque uh, in oh, front okay. of their house. I, did you they, have something to do with that? Uh, actually, a student oh, okay. who read my book uh, organized a GoFundMe page to, uh, uh, or Kickstarter, I can't remember which, whatever it is, where you raise money on the internet. Well done. Get together money to write a plaque, and the plaque is there uh, on the house now. But well these folks were interesting for me to write about for a couple of reasons. One is they left a record. Uh, Bob Merriman kept a diary the whole of his time in Spain, uh, and that is so useful when you're writing history because you want to find voices from the times. One of the places where you find them is diaries. And there, he's one of three people in the book who might not have been there, at least not been there so prominently, had they not kept diaries. Amazingly, his diary survived the war because uh, just a few months before he was killed in Spain, uh, but and a few months before he was killed, he gave the diaries that he'd kept so far 
uh, to his wife Marion, who was the only woman in uniform from the United States at the International Brigade's headquarters. She spoke Spanish, she worked as a clerk there, um, so they were in, in Spain together. Uh, and she wrote a memoir many years later, plus letters between the two of them survived. So these are, I think of as the three basic building blocks of a historian's trade, memoirs, letters, and diaries. And if you've got them all, then you can build a character because you know something about what these people were thinking and feeling. So, so if we want to be remembered by history, we should keep a diary, write letters, and uh, get someone write to write a memoir about us. And, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the that, diaries are the most important, I think, because then you say what, you, what you're really thinking and experiencing. And sometimes it's fascinating to compare what somebody says in their diary and what they wrote years later in a memoir. Another one of the characters I follow, follow uh, Louis Fisher, Louis Fisher, who was an American journalist who spent a lot of time in Spain, uh, kept a diary while he was there. And then he wrote a memoir uh, some years later, a few years later. His memoir is very self-important and sort of makes it sound like he knows, you know, the way International journalists always want to sound that you're getting the latest inside dope on this or that from <laughs> the ambassador, the prime minister, or whatever. But in his diary, he's complaining about things that these same people won't tell him. Um, so that disparity can be interesting. So, um, you know, uh, one of the other questions or like I have or that came up when Rick and I were talking about the show um, sort of a chicken and the egg scenario. So um, Hitler and Mussolini almost right out of the gate decide to support Franco. The Spanish government um, goes to the Western democracies and says, we need help. We, they kind of just close their eyes or their ears or whatever you have. Stalin steps in. Um, the Communist Party begins to recruit to send uh, international volunteers to Spain. Um, but in a way that kind of hurts them further on down the road. Um, does, does Stalin's involvement and support of the Republican government, does it end up hurting them in the end? No, I don't think so. It, it was the only place, it was the only major country that would sell them arms. And they needed these arms desperately because they were up against the very best that Germany could produce. You know, I mentioned the Messerschmitt fighter, the Stuka dive bomber, the latest and best artillery piece that was used in World War II, would be later used in World War II. Uh, Russia was the only place they could get a supply of arms uh, to fight against these things. So it, Stalin's support definitely sustained the Republican government uh, a lot longer than it would have lasted otherwise. Uh, it took Franco uh, almost three years uh, to win the war at a tremendous cost in human life on both sides. Uh, but they wouldn't have lasted more than a few months uh, without Soviet help. Uh, Stalin basically, by a year or two before the end of the war, he realized that he couldn't stop selling these arms to Spain uh, because, you know, he, he he would look terrible as leader of the world communist movement if he stopped supplying these arms to left-wing government. But it became increasingly difficult to get them there because Mussolini's submarines began sinking Soviet freighters that were taking shipments of arms through the Mediterranean to Spain. And the only other way to get them to Spain was to send the arms to France and have them go through France and come over the border. Uh, and the French periodically uh, uh, stopped up that bottleneck and held up these arms shipments for several months at a time. So the last year or so of the war, the Soviet arms had a great deal of trouble getting through and Stalin withdrew a lot of the, the military advisors that had been crucial and also in helping keeping the, the government going up to that point. Did, did you ever come across, as you're going through these diaries and these letters, any uh, of the International Brigade members kind of questioning this close association with Stalin? 
I mean, I you know, they, I know a lot of them were true believers. A lot of them probably went there because the Communist Party paid their ticket to get there. But was anybody kind of did they stop and think? Well, uh, relatively, relatively few of them, because those who volunteered to join the international brigades, they knew this was a communist organized operation. There were, however, people who fought for other left-wing factions in Spain. George Orwell, most notably, right. uh, yeah. was one of several thousand volunteers who fought with a militia that was associated with a kind of independent, semi-anarchist leftist party uh, in northeastern Spain. And they hated the communists. And at one point, uh, and George Orwell writes about this in Homage to Catalonia, there was a sort of little civil war within the civil war that broke out uh, between these two factions. Uh, the, there was a sort of odd alliance between the mainstream parties of the Spanish Republic and the communists, both of whom felt, and I think unfortunately correctly, that if they were going to have a chance of beating this rebel army that was backed by Hitler, uh, they had to have a centralized army reporting to a centralized general staff and not have the situation that they'd had up to that point in time where several of these independent left-wing parties, like the one that Orwell was affiliated with, had their own militia groups uh, at the front. And things finally came to blows. Uh, and there were a couple hundred people killed in Barcelona in uh, the spring of 1938 in this little civil war within the Civil War, which had a huge effect on Orwell because he was a witness to that street fighting uh, and happily escaped being hurt himself during that time. But he saw the viciousness with which the communists went after their political opponents. And then he saw how differently this was reported in the press uh, than it was from how he'd actually experienced it. Yeah. Rick, before I ask another question, do you... <laughs> Sorry, I muted there for a moment. I'm going to bring in uh, a question from one of our yeah. viewers. Uh, Doreen says, how many American citizens lost their lives fighting in the Spanish Civil War? And what did the U.S. government think about U.S. citizens going to fight in another country's war. And I'll add something to that, Adam, which is, you know, what did they think at the time and, and what did they think later uh, okay. of these people who fought in that war? Uh, there were, of those 2,800 Americans, about 750 lost their lives, did mm -hmm. not come home, and are buried in Spain. Uh, in some cases, we know where the graves are. In some cases, we don't know. Uh, the U.S. government... Uh, was officially very much opposed to their going to, to Spain because they didn't want Americans mixed up in somebody else's civil war. And the U.S. government made every possible effort to stop them from going, uh, but people went anyway because they were determined to volunteer. Uh, and they saw this fight against fascism as crucially important, which it certainly was. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was president then, had very mixed feelings. On the one hand, he increasingly, especially over the course of the war, became more and more aware of the danger of aggressive fascism. And, but in running for re-election in 1936, after his first term, the war had just broken out a couple months before he ran for re-election the first time, and it is widely believed, although there's no evidence on this of this on paper because it wouldn't have suited anybody to put it on paper, it's widely believed that Roosevelt promised the hierarchy of the American Catholic Church that the U.S. would stay neutral in Spain. The Catholic Church was heavily supporting General Franco because the Spanish Republic uh, was deeply anti-clerical. Uh, so Roosevelt had, was bound by that, had very mixed feelings. Towards the end, toyed with a plan to um, uh, get U.S. arms to Spain via Latin America, which would conceal their origin. 
but it was too late when he began to even think about that. He was very well of what, aware of what was going on there because he read the newspapers. There was you know, quite good extensive American press coverage of the war, it received an enormous amount of attention. And Martha Gellhorn, the journalist who was th then in Spain as Ernest Hemingway's girlfriend, later became his, his wife, uh, his third wife, uh, was very close to Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Martha Gellhorn had worked for Eleanor, had actually lived in the White House for a time, and she was writing Eleanor a stream of letters about what was going on in Spain. You have to intervene here, you have to send help. Uh, and Eleanor is very diplomatic in her replies, but at one point finally let her guard drop and mention something about being ashamed that the U.S. had not done more. After the men returned from Spain, uh, they found uh, uh, initially a lot of hostility in the U.S. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was then the head of the FBI and saw crushing the communists and crushing Americans he thought were communist sympathizers as being his main work and went after these folks ruthlessly for decades exactly sending you know, agents to do reports like this. This particular report is dated uh, uh, 10 years after the end of the war, and they're sending FBI agents to investigate uh, a guy who is one of the characters in my book, who was an uh, American ambulance driver in Spain and kept an extraordinary diary. And you know, 10, 20 years after the war, they were still sending FBI agents to interview the employers of Spanish Civil War veterans. Ironically, over that course of time, uh, a great many of those surviving veterans, in fact, the vast majority of them, lost their sympathy for the communist movement, just the way you know, the vast majority of Communist Party members, you know, people who were party members in the 30s, uh, anywhere in the Western world eventually did, as the, you know, the truth of what Stalin had done actually came out. So there were very few who stayed true believers to the very end in, in that sense. My turn? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. yeah your ahead. turn. Um, and one of the things that also that you talk about um, is uh, the many, you know, incredibly gifted people that were in Spain, they were covering the story. Uh, you quote, uh, or you mentioned a statistic where the New York Times um, had a thousand front page stories that dealt with the war in Spain. Um, but you also say that this, this incredibly gifted, large press corps that was in Spain covering the war kind of missed one of the big stories. Uh, and, and what is that big story and how did they miss it? Actually, there were, there were two big stories they missed. And this is something that always interests me when I write, his, when I write history because uh, I've been a journalist. Uh, I have worked from other countries. Excuse me. So, bless you. God um, bless you. I think that maybe we're, we're in the midst of a lot of smoke from these forest fires in Berkeley. And uh, some of that may have seeped into the house. Um, I've worked as a journalist in other countries. And I know how sometimes it's difficult to know what's happening. You tend to rely on your colleagues. Journalists often sort of travel in packs and practice a certain kind of herd behavior. And because there were so many foreign journalists in Spain, there were a lot of memoirs and letters and so forth about this. The reporters who covered the Spanish Civil War from the Republican side all stayed in the same hotel in Madrid, the Hotel Florida, uh, all sorts of well-documented love affairs took place there, most notably the one between Hemingway and Gellhorn. Uh, they ate dinner every night at a nearby restaurant where there was a long table reserved for the foreign press, and they tended to copy each other in their stories. They missed two big stories. The first one was this. The big story from Madrid was the bombardment. Here was the first time that a major European city had been under heavy, sustained aerial bombardment, month after month after month. And these reporters were there. They could look up in the sky and see the German planes, because uh, these were the planes that Hitler had sent Franco. None of them ever stopped to ask, 
where are those planes getting their gasoline? Mm. Which was such a basic question because there was officially an international oil embargo. Uh, no one was supposed to sell oil to Spain. The United States was supposedly, which was then the world's major source of oil, was supposedly uh, abiding by this embargo. But Franco had plenty of gasoline for aviation gas for the planes, diesel fuel for his tanks, uh, regular gasoline to run the army trucks and so forth. The reporters never asked where it was coming from. Where was it coming from? It was coming from Texas because the head of the Texaco oil company was a fascist sympathizer, a man of Norwegian origin named Torkild Reber. Uh, and he was such an enthusiast for General Franco and other strongmen around the world uh, that he actually made two trips to Spain during the war. And he sold Franco uh, Texaco oil at a reduced rate, uh, allowing payment by credit after the war uh, was over. These Texaco uh, oil tankers would leave the Texaco's uh, the terminus of the Texaco pipeline at Port Arthur, Texas, with orders that were shown to the harbor master and so forth, sending them to, you know, Antwerp or Rotterdam or other European ports. Once they were at sea, the captains would open sealed orders, redirecting them to ports in nationalist Spain. And this was something that the, the you know, the reporters writing at the time never looked into. Uh, there was absolutely no reporting of this. But without that oil, you know, Franco couldn't have fought the war. Mm -hmm. It only gradually emerged uh, much later. And actually, I got a lot of help on this score for research from a Spanish guy who was an anti-fascist. Uh, he'd uh, been a left-wing student during the last years of the Franco regime. Then he'd spent his life as a petroleum engineer and had always been interested in this question of where did the Franco's fascists get their oil. He got into the records of the Spanish National Oil Company, found correspondence, published a couple of articles of this, very generously shared his research uh, with me. So I saw, you know, Texaco officials writing each other in English about how are we going to get the, the oil to Franco. Hmm. That was one story the correspondents missed. The other big story they missed was this, and there were just a few passing references to it, but almost nothing in the, in the daily press. Um, in northeastern Spain, uh, Catalonia, uh, 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 the, the area that today is you know, around the city of Barcelona and some, some way in, inland, um, and neighboring Aragon. Uh, this was a, an area of the country where the anarchist movement was very strong. This was a tradition, political tradition, that had pretty much died out everywhere else in the world. But it was always strong in northeastern Spain. And when Franco tried to stage his coup in 1936, it was defeated in that northeastern corner of the country by uh, militias from these anarchist sympathizing uh, labor unions. And for a period of about six months, there existed in that part of the country the farthest reaching social revolution that Western Europe has ever seen. Peasants took over these huge estates where they had worked as landless laborers. Workers took over the factories and in many cases converted them to making desperately needed weapons for the front. Uh, the Ritz Hotel in Barcelona, the city's fanciest, was taken over by its cooks, waiters, and busboys and turned into people's cafeteria number one for the poor. And the correspondents weren't writing about this. They were practicing this herd behavior, reporting the bombing of Madrid. And, you know, like many people, both on the center and the left in Spain, they looked askance at these anarchists who were trying to have a social revolution in the middle of a war. Uh, and there was almost no reporting on this. George Orwell, who went to Spain sympathizing with these anarchists, 
did see exactly what was happening and wrote about it very movingly in his extraordinary memoir, Homage to Catalonia. But almost nobody else wrote about it. Uh, there was, however, an American couple who were at the heart of all this, and they are the characters I'm most pleased at having discovered to put in the book. Uh, the American eyewitness to this extraordinary social revolution who wrote the most about it in English at the time in letters to her family, uh, afterwards in a memoir that was never published, was a 19-year-old woman who had been in Europe on her honeymoon when this revolution broke out. Lois Orr came from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, she had a somewhat older, somewhat stodgier husband. Uh, <laughs> they had gone to Europe on their honeymoon. Uh, they were traveling in France and Germany when they got word that, you know, northeastern Spain is in upheaval. You know, the workers are taking over the factories. Lois said to her husband, we have to go there. They did. They lived there for 10 months. She described this in an extraordinary series of, of letters home to her family later wrote and rewrote and rewrote a memoir about this period, which, which sadly was never published, but I was able to read it uh, thanks to her daughter who gave me copies of it. Adam, one of the things that you do in your books is you, um, and you know, uh, 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 in all of your books, is you introduce us to a host of characters who maybe were well known in their day, maybe not, but who are not that well known now, who are very active in, um, in various movements. And uh, <clears throat> whether it's the movement to end slavery or whether it's uh, in, in uh, Bury the Chains or whether it's anti-war activists in To End All Wars. Um, and I wonder uh, uh, if you can talk a little bit about your, um, how you get started and how you find these people and, and how you kind of organize this. And one of the things I, I really, uh, you sent us this great um, little document that you had written out, <laughs> your sort of, your, your character timeline list. And maybe in your answer, you can incorporate sort of what Good. this means and how you, how you do this. Because okay. Chris and I both want to use your help. <laughs> we, we want we want to improve our writing ability, so we want you to give us some pointers. Well, you know, it's it's uh, astounding that uh, putting people at the center of writing history should be thought to be unusual or a radical idea in any way. Because after all, it's people who make history. History is composed of of people, and yes, there are natural forces, you know hurricanes and droughts and all sorts of things that sweep over us, but it's still us human beings who are living through all this. So when I set out to write a book about something, you know, where I knew I'm interested in this, this event, this time and place, the Spanish Civil War, and I'm interested in the Americans who were in it, um, I think, okay, who's my cast of characters? It's almost like I'm a theater director, I'm casting a play, and I want some American volunteers, I want some American journalists, uh, I want some people who may have been there for other reasons that I, I can't guess until I find out something about them, like this woman Lois Orr, the 19-year-old from Kentucky. Um, and I look for them, and I think, when, you know, when I have a dozen or so, I feel, all right, I've got my cast for the book. I mean, if you want to put that thing back on, up on the screen, I can walk you through who they are. Uh, that's at the top, if you can read my it's new character list. And I was trying to keep track as I was planning the outline or the, of the book, who are the who are the main characters that I'm going to have on stage and when were they there? And of course, I'm always very happy when several of them meet each other in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And you can see at the top, I have FDR and Eleanor. Bob and Mary and Merriman, we talked about. Uh, uh, Louis Fisher was this sort of windbag journalist, but who wrote a lengthy memoir, kept a diary, and interacted with most of the other people on the list in one way or another. 
Uh, so he's in the book. He's also an interesting case because he's somebody who started off as a true believer in the communist movement and by the end of his time in Spain, because it coincided with the purges in Russia, where he knew a number of people who perished, he was completely disillusioned, although he never regretted his support for the Spanish Republic. Um, Millie Bennett is sort of a minor character, uh, was an American journalist who was there, who fell in love with a, uh, uh, a member of the Lincoln Brigade, and one of the American volunteers. It's always great when you have people falling in or out of love, especially if they've left a record of it in <laughs> diaries, letters, whatever. Uh, the Orrs were the, car the couple from Kentucky that we talked about. Orwell and Hemingway, you know, uh, couldn't leave them out of a book on Spain. Uh, Martha Gellhorn, then Hemingway's uh, girlfriend or partner, later his, uh, uh, his third wife. Virginia Cowles was an American journalist, very young American journalist, 26 when she arrived in Spain, uh, who I think was the best English language correspondent in the war, and I read a lot of reporting. Uh, she was very enterprising, she was skeptical of things that people told her, and she was the only journalist uh, writing in English who reported from both sides, managed to get into Franco's Spain as well, and wrote remarkable stuff about it, then came back to the, uh, to the Republican side. Uh, Jason Gurney was a British guy, I, almost every, everyone else on this list is American, but he was a British guy, but I let him into the book because he wrote a memoir that was a good one, and he fought in the American battalion. He didn't get on with the people in the British battalion, so he transferred, and he fell in love with Toby Jensky, uh, an American nurse who took care of him when he was wounded, um, and they had a passionate love affair, which they each described very differently. She was much less passionate about him than he was about her, <laughs> and described it in letters. Uh, Jim Nugas was the ambulance driver. We were speaking about him, who uh, was later spied on uh, by the FBI, uh, wrote a beautiful diary. Uh, I think the, the in, in some, really the finest piece of writing by an American volunteer in Spain, that he died quite young, uh, only about 10, 15 years after the war. Everyone assumed his diary was lost, but then somebody saw it and recognized it on sale in a used bookstore in Vermont in the year 2010. Nobody's sure how it got there. Uh, but, uh, and then it was published, edited by uh, two very fine historians of the war, Peter Carroll and Peter Glazer, and it was an essential document for me because it is so moving. So these were the, the main people I put in the book. So, so, so Adam, you know, you, you don't come to these topics because you're an expert or you, you focus on just one time period. You've written fantastic books about the abolition movement and uh, kind of slavery in the Congo and World War One and the Spanish Civil War. So, if it's not a specific time period that interests you, what, what, what attracts you? What's the story that grabs you that you need to tell? Well, uh, you know, I write uh, I've, uh, I write a book about a particular time period, not because I'm an expert in it, which I'm not in any of these things, but because I want to learn about it. That's the excitement. Uh, I can't imagine anything more boring than writing about just the Spanish Civil War my whole life long, or just World War I, or just anything, anything else. So I love this jumping around between countries and between continents. I go because I want to learn some. I'm, I'm interested in a period, but I want to learn something about it. Why do I get interested in a period? Usually because it's there's some kind of struggle between good and evil, or between people who are trying to remake the world in what they think is a good way, uh, and those who want to stop them. I mean, that's what drew me to the anti-slavery movement, certainly slavery, one of the great evils of all time. How did this relatively small group of people in England, starting in the 1780s, 
managed to turn around public opinion on an institution that had been there for thousands of years because you know not only had the the brits had slaves for hundreds of years but the romans had slaves the greeks had slaves it was kind of widely accepted all over the world and then also i'm interested when things turn out to be more complex than they appeared which was certainly the case in spain where it was yes a fight between uh fascism and democracy but when you have the the country that's uh, being the principal seller of arms to the democracy, being Stalin's Soviet Union, things get very complicated <laughs> indeed. So sometimes the complexity of trying to parse that out and to think about how it felt to people on the ground at, a, at the time make it uh, even more interesting. So uh, it, 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 it's probably uh, only fair of us to mention that uh, 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 Spain in Our Hearts is not your most recent book that that is a book called Rebel Cinderella that uh, has come out relatively recently. And we I think we did promise the publicist that we would mention it and give you a chance okay. to say what it is and uh, and tell people about that. So uh, go go for that. Before you go for that, I do actually want to say we, we, we've gotten a number of comments and questions from people that we haven't had time to get to, and we apologize for that. And Adam, I hope it's okay if I email you a couple of them ask if, if you can give us some short answers sure. on them and then I'll post them up on the yeah, Facebook page because I mean, we don't want to we don't want to we've asked people to ask questions and then here we are not asking their questions because we're yeah. so interested in our own questions <laughs> but tell us I, about uh, tell us about rebel Cinderella well again it's a case where I got interested in people who wanted to change the world um, they failed miserably at doing so, as is the case for most of us who set off to try and change the world. But I was still fascinated by it. And there was another reason why, also while it was interesting. Uh, this was a chance to get inside a marriage of a little over 100 years ago, where there was an extensive written record, a diary, uh, dueling memoirs, uh, huge hundreds and hundreds of letters. And it was an extraordinarily unusual marriage. Uh, Rose Pastor was an immigrant to the United States, Jewish, arrived in 1890 at the age of 11. Uh, family was extremely poor. She had less than two years of formal schooling. She had to work for a dozen years as a factory worker in a factory making cigars. By the end of that time, in her early 20s, she was supporting herself, her mother, and six younger siblings who'd been abandoned by a ne'er-do-well stepfather. When she was 23, she met and fell in love with a guy who was wasp and from one of the wealthiest families in the United States, James Graham Phelps Stokes, an heir to the Phelps Dodge mining fortune and uh, much other wealth as well. Uh, they married in 1905. It was literally front page news in the New York Times and other newspapers all over the country, mentioned in other countries as well, because it was so unusual, a marriage between someone so rich and so poor and Jew and Gentile, which was extremely unusual for that time. In 1906, the year after they married, they both joined the Socialist Party. And over the next decade or so, they knew, were friends with, and often had as their house guests, all the most interesting people in the United States at that time. Uh, Emma Goldman, John Reed, Lincoln Steffens, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, you know, uh, that, that whole crew of people who were sort of the visionary reformer types in the kind of magical period just before the First World War when people were so certain that the world could be peacefully reformed, uh, and easily so. Uh, and uh, so this, is the bo this book is the story of this marriage. It's mainly a biography of her, uh, as called Rebel Cinderella, because every reporter in the world who wrote about this marriage at the time saw it as the Cinderella story, you know, mm -hmm. Prince Charming in his enormous castle, and indeed, Graham Stokes's family had one, owned what at one point was the largest private house in the United States, 100 rooms. Prince Charming comes along and rescues Cinderella. But 
She didn't want that role, and she ended up being by far the more interesting, uh, decisive, and complex person. So it's kind of a joint biography. Chris, I'm going to give you the last word here. Uh, just thank you so much for talking about Spain. And, and since uh, the origin of these shows um, is about going to places where history happened, I'd like to, I always like to ask one last question. And I know you've traveled to some of the places that you've written about. And I just like to know what you think. Why is it important to go to see where these events happened? Well, you want to see what it looked like. Uh, to try to put yourself into the minds of the characters you're writing about. Uh, I went to several places in Spain. One that I was particularly eager to see, I, we talked about the couple, the Merrimans, Bob and Marion Merriman. And Bob Merriman was killed in Spain. We know the day on which uh, he was last seen alive. We don't know precisely how he was killed, but he was almost certainly captured by Franco's troops and executed that night or the next morning. Uh, but we know where he was last seen alive, which was when he was leading a group of uh, uh, American and other foreign volunteers and some Spanish soldiers who were trying to escape being encircled by Franco's troops. And he was last seen alive on a hilltop in northeastern Spain. This is the scene from that hilltop. And if you imagine yourself here, uh, April 1938, he's on this hilltop. He knows that if he can get him and his men across this valley in front of them and over that next range of hills, there's a river. And once they swim that river, they'll be safe because the Spanish Republic holds the land on the other side. But there were troops behind them. There were uh, Franco's troops coming down the valley from one side, Mussolini's Italians coming down from the other side. So they faced the decision, were they going to try to slip across the valley in the daytime, wait for, or wait for nightfall when it might be easier to do it? We don't know exactly what they decided, but that hill was where he was last seen alive, so I wanted to go there. Thank you. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining us. I only have about 78 other questions that we're not going to be able to get to. So uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have to come back and do it again sometime. But uh, I, I want to thank to. again um, Adam Hochschild, who's the author of Spain in Our Hearts, Americans in the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939, among many other excellent books that if we haven't said it three or four times yet and really embarrassed you, we'll say again that are really excellent and that we really like. And, and we should really read. appreciate your being with us today. Well, Chris and Rick, thank you both. I really love the chance to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. So, Chris, you have a, um, you have a uh, history all around us, I think, for us today. And it's one that uh, Adam mentioned uh, in, our, uh, in our interview with him. I did. Um, so, um, for those of you who have kind of followed me on Facebook and checked these things out, You'll know that um, I went to Cable Street earlier this year, uh, and that was a place where the local citizens stopped the fascists from marching down their street. Uh, and uh, many of the people that took part in the Cable Street uh, resistance uh, later on went to Spain. They fought with the British battalions in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, and this is the monument to the international brigades in London. And it was very important for me to go and see it uh, because I've always been a huge admirer of uh, these men who went to fight a fight that wasn't theirs because they saw something that was wrong and had to be stopped. Um, and so just really briefly, uh, this monument was uh, dedicated in, in London in 1985. It later went to Jubilee Park, which is right across from the Houses of Parliament in 2012. Um, Adam mentioned that there were f about 40,000 uh, people who served in the international brigades. And just to give you an idea of their commitment and their sacrifice, um, 15,000 of them become casualties fighting in Spain. Uh, and they've been kind of overlooked in the general discussion about um, fighting fascism and fighting the Nazis and, and being aware of what was coming. Uh, so I'd just like to read something from Margaret Gellhorn, 
uh, who was a reporter in Spain and who later became uh, Hemingway's uh, third wife. Uh, she said of the men of the International Brigade, they deserve our thanks and respect and they got neither. So I would just encourage people to maybe read a little bit more about them uh, and find out about what they did. Well, absolutely. I agree. It's an amazing topic and I'm, I'm delighted that we were able to spend some time on it today. And um, next week, uh, I should just, I uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention that we will be uh, speaking with uh, Susan Eisenhower um, about her book, How Ike Led, the Ike yep. in question being her grandfather and uh, uh, obviously the leader of uh, the American army in uh, Europe during World War II. So, and if folks have traveled with me, they know that on the eighth day, God created Eisenhower. So yes, I'm, I'm looking Chris, forward to this. Chris one. is a big Eisenhower fan. So uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, see you next week. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. Thank you.